I am very excited to say this morning, please open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Because this morning we're going to begin a series going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And uh, to me, that's a very exciting thing. Indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a thrilling thing. And so let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be gathered together in this place where we can give our attention to you and to know that your spirit is here to teach us. And Lord, not just to teach us for the sake of our mind, though you don't neglect our mind. But Lord, you're here to teach our lives. And we want to receive that from you right now this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we do begin what's going to be a long series, verse by verse through the book of Acts. I say long, not because I'm going to try to milk it and make it as long as I can, but just because it's a big book. And I would anticipate that as I sort of look it out, we're, we're, we could be in the book of Acts for at least a year because it has 28 chapters. And I think that normally speaking, I probably wouldn't be able to do more than half a chapter a week. But uh, I'm not trying to set myself to any particular pace. We're just going to make our way through it as we would feel the Spirit of God would guide us regarding the pace. But it's going to be a thrilling journey, I think, because I believe that the book of Acts speaks very powerfully to the church today. And instead of making a big, long introduction, which you really could with a book like this, I could really spend some profitable time discussing some of the dominant themes that go all the way through from chapter 1 to chapter 28, all through the book of Acts, because there's several important dominant themes, but I prefer to touch on those things as we make our way through the book. So let's just jump right into it. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Right here, the writer of the book of Acts, who was the associate of the Apostle Paul, known as Luke, he refers to the former account that he wrote. And the former account that he wrote is itself the Gospel of Luke. You see, at one time, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were joined together, not in one volume, so to speak, but rather as two scrolls that were meant to tell one story. I mean, please remember, when the book of Acts and when the Gospel of Luke were written, they wrote on ancient scrolls. And these scrolls would normally be somewhere about 35 feet in length. They didn't get much longer than that, because if they were, they were just sort of unwieldy to carry around and to handle. So an ancient scroll was up to about 35 feet in length. Well, that is about how much you would need to fill out the Gospel of Luke. And then you would need another scroll for the book of Acts. You would think that if they made scrolls back then in 70 feet length, Luke would have written the whole thing on one scroll. But just because of the limitations of the technology of the time, the media technology... He wrote it in two different volumes, first the Gospel of Luke and now the book of Acts. The book of Acts is extremely important. Imagine what it would be like if the book of Acts was ripped out of your Bible, if it didn't even exist in there. You'd pick up the Bible and you'd read the thrilling ministry of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're just thrilled to it. And then you'd be finished with that, and then you'd turn over to the next book in your New Testament, and it would be the book of Romans. You say, well, what? I left it at the end of the Gospel of John, and there they are in Jerusalem. And now I pick it up with Romans, and there the, he's writing to Christians in Rome. How did the Gospel get all the way from Jerusalem to Rome? What, what happened in the time in between? And the book of Acts answers that question. And that expansion from Jerusalem to Rome is a remarkable story. It really, just historically speaking, even if you were to take sort of the spiritual equation out of it, just historically, it's a fascinating story. Because here you have this group of people, and I'll read a little bit from James Montgomery Boyce. He gives a wonderful insight here. He says, humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it. It had no money, no proven leaders, no technological tools for propagating the gospel, and it faced enormous obstacles. It was utterly new. It taught truths that were incredible to the unregenerate world, and it was the subject of the most intense hatreds and persecutions. So this very unlikely faith 
ends up spreading all the way from Jerusalem to Rome and then dominating the world even beyond that. It's a fascinating story. So he begins with the Gospel of Luke, he continues it in the book of Acts, and he says the former account, verse 1 again, the former account I made, the I there again would be Luke. Now we really don't know all that much about Luke from the New Testament. We know that he was a physician, Colossians chapter 4 tells us that. We know that he was a Gentile, and we base that just on his name and the circumstances of how he met the Apostle Paul. And we know that he was a devoted companion of the Apostle Paul. Other than that, we don't know a whole lot about him. And that we know even less about the man that he wrote this to. Did you see what it said there in verse 1? The former account I made, okay, the I there is Luke, O Theophilus. Well, who's Theophilus? Well, this man might have been a Christian who wanted some instruction. He, he might have been a Roman official who was being briefed by Luke about the history of the Christian movement. Th that's my favorite solution for who Theophilus was. Or some people suggest that the name was symbolic. I don't believe it, but I could see why they would say that. They say perhaps the name is symbolic because the name Theophilus means God lover. And maybe Luke was just writing to all the God lovers in the world who would want to know the story about Jesus and how the work that he started extended all the way to Rome and throughout the Roman Empire. But actually, I am most persuaded by the idea that Luke and Acts were written together as sort of a defense brief for the Apostle Paul. I mean, think where the book of Acts ends in chapter 28. It ends with Paul in Rome awaiting trial before Caesar. Well, any Roman magistrate who would have the man like this on trial, they would want to know something of the background of the case. Well, why is this man in my court? He's on trial for preaching Jesus. Well, who's Jesus? What did he do? And I believe that Luke and Acts were written, if you could say, as a friend of the court brief. Luke saying, let me tell you the story. And I'll tell you another reason why I think that. Because when you take a look at the depiction of Roman officials in Luke and Acts, they always look good. <laughs> Roman officials in Luke and Acts always come off as smart and wise and godly. And you could see that, no, Luke isn't fudging on the story. He's just presenting it in a way that would be advantageous to his client, and that would be the Apostle Paul. And so it's fascinating to think Luke wrote this as a way to prepare the Roman court that would try the Apostle Paul. Well, he continues on here in verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. I'm going to say that again just because I like those words. Of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, the former account, that is, the, the Gospel of Luke, it concerned all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The, the Gospel describes only the beginning of Jesus' work. The book of Acts describes the continuation of Jesus' work. And the work of Jesus continues to our very present day. Now, I don't know about you, but I look right here in my Bible. And up at the top there, what does it say? It says, the Acts of the Apostles. I don't know that that's such a great title. But again, I just want to remind you, the title wasn't given to it by Luke. Luke didn't write out in big Greek letters, the <laughs> Acts of the Apostles. Those titles were added by us later on. But wouldn't it be just as accurate or more accurate and more glorious to maybe title this book, The Acts of the Risen Jesus Reigning from Heaven? Because that's what he's doing. Or how about this? The Acts of the Holy Spirit through his church. That's what we find in this book. Acts of the Apostles. Yes, the Apostles are doing their work in the book of Acts. But never miss the point. They're doing their work because they are driven by the Spirit of God to do it. This is a remarkable instance of how the, the, the church did this amazing work in the first century. And they didn't do it primarily through programs or strategies or technologies. But they did it as they were driven by the Spirit of God. And I'll add this as well. We have to remember that Acts does not give us a full history of the church during this period. 
Matter of fact, we're told something in Acts chapter 9 about churches in the region of Galilee and churches in the region of Samaria. And you know what? We're just given a few words about them. But we know from history that there were thriving churches in the region of Galilee. There were thriving works of God done in the area of Samaria. As well, we know from history that there was a strong church in Egypt established in this very period. And the book of Acts doesn't tell us anything about it. This is what I want you to understand. The book of Acts is just one Holy Spirit-inspired slice of what God was doing in the world at that very time. Over this period of about 30 years, by the way, I want to remind you that, and I'll remind you that frequently as we make our way through the book of Acts, that the book of Acts concerns a period of about 30 years. Now, some people read the book of Acts and they go, wow, it's amazing. There, there was a, something amazing happening every day, every week. Well, again, remember, it's written over 30 years. And this is one of the great reasons why I believe that God is still writing the book of Acts in a sense. Now, I don't mean an authoritative sense and that we still have authoritative apostolic revelation just as much as this was the foundation given to us in the first century. But there is a sense in which God's work in this world continues with just as much strength, with just as much glory. If you were to write the history of the Calvary Chapel movement over the last 30 years, and please remember, friends, the Calvary Chapel movement is just one aspect, one small aspect of what God is doing all over the world. But if you were just to write the history of that one aspect and write the highlights over the last 30 years, it would read very much like the book of Acts. Because God is still moving this way today. God's work in the world still continues. Okay, now, verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So here he's continuing on the story, starting in verse 2, until the day in which Jesus was taken up. There came a day 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus in which Jesus was taken up to heaven. He ascended into heaven, and before he did, he instructed the apostles about what to do in his absence. He gave them, notice it right there in verse 2, he had given commandments to the apostles. And I think it's extremely significant what it says in verse 2. Would you look at that again with me? He says, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments. Now, those words right there just blew my mind. Because do you understand what it says? It says that the risen, resurrected, glorified Jesus still did his ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, I think of Jesus in the days of his earthly humility, if you would say, during the three years of his ministry. I think of Jesus saying, okay, I will rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to show my followers that I can, to show my submission to my Father, to show the unity of the Godhead and the Holy Trinity. I will not operate on my own authority, but I will operate in submission to the Holy Spirit of God. I can understand Jesus doing that during the three years of his humble ministry on earth. But after his resurrection, don't you think he'd but just be dying, itching to flex his muscles, so to speak? To say, listen, you know, I, 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 it's fine for me to rely on the Holy Spirit for those last three years, but I want to show people I can do stuff on my own as well. But he didn't. He said, no. Even in this teaching ministry that he had as a risen, resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus, he said, I will rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. It says very plainly there that he did this through the Holy Spirit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know the point I'm going to make from this, right? I can invite any one of you. I mean, you could preach this next point for me. It's very plain. If the risen, glorified Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit, what excuse do we have for not doing it? What excuse do we have for, for even letting the shadow of that thought cross our mind? Well, I'll show them what I can do. No, Jesus never thought that way. It wasn't, I'll show them what I can do. It's, I'll show them what the Spirit of God can do in me and through me. 
that sort of humble submission and reliance on the Holy Spirit's power, that's what sees the work of God done in our world. And this is a pattern for the rest of the book of Acts where it shows us what the Holy Spirit does operating through the church. What, what did he do going on here in verse 3? It says, to whom, that is the apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Jesus appeared to his disciples enough times, and not just to the twelve, but to many of his followers. He appeared to them enough time and enough convincing ways so that they knew, that they knew, that they knew that he had risen from the dead. He left no possible doubt that he was resurrected just exactly as he promised. I like it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. Paul describes one of the many infallible proofs. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. It says, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. In other words, in Paul's day when he was writing 1 Corinthians. Can you imagine what an infallible proof Jesus gave of his resurrection? How can you know I'm resurrected? Because I appeared to 500 of my followers at once. And most of those people were still alive in the days that Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. Friends, that's an infallible proof. That shows that this business of the resurrection just wasn't a delusion of the disciples. No, no, more than 500 individuals saw that and they would still testify some 25 years later in the days of Paul's ministry. So here, after this brief introduction, now starting in verse 4, Luke is going to embark on telling us more of the story and especially the ascension of Jesus. Here we go. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, Jesus had nothing else for the disciples to do at this point other than for them to return to Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus calls here the promise of the Father. You see, Jesus had one letter of instruction, for them, one thing for them to do. Guys, here's your to-do list. It's one box. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus knew they couldn't do anything significant for God without this empowering of the Holy Spirit. Friends, do you know that in your life? Do you understand that God has deliberately constructed the Christian life to be so big, to be so challenging, that you can't do it on your own? That you can only do it effectively as you are filled and empowered and surrendered to the power of the Spirit. That's how God has made it. I think of that all the time. I think of that virtually every Sunday, every time I stand before God's people to teach. And this is what I think. I think the very best I can do isn't enough. I could have my best Sunday ever and it still wouldn't touch you where you need it. Because what you need is something more than what I can give. What you need is to be touched by the Spirit of God. And so I cry out to God, God, my best isn't good enough. The, the very best I could do, if somehow I could, I could bring everything into alignment and do the very best that David Guza could do, it wouldn't be enough. They need something from you, God. And that sort of attitude should bleed over into every aspect of my Christian life and your Christian life. And so Jesus told his disciples, I want you to go and I want you to wait. Wait for the coming of the Spirit. It's really interesting, isn't it? To, to say wait means that it was worth waiting for. Generally, as a person, I hate to wait. I'm just not a good waiter. I will walk into a restaurant and be really hungry and really want to eat the food at that restaurant, if there's a line, I'll turn around and just leave. I just hate to wait. That's just sort of, it's not a compliment to me. It's really sort of a defect in my character. I'm just not a waiter. But Jesus says what? He says, guys, this is worth it. I want you to wait. And to wait also means that they had a promise that it would come. Would it not have been cruel of Jesus to tell them to wait for something that would never come? That's torture. 
But Jesus said, no, wait, guys, because my command to you to wait is actually an invitation, a promise to you that it will come. To, to wait also means that they had to receive it. They couldn't create it. I'm talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? They couldn't work it up within themselves. And sometimes this is very sad in the Christian world, is it not? Where people sort of seem to try to work up the presence or the filling of the Holy Spirit within themselves as if their energy, their enthusiasm, their will could create it in themselves. Instead, what did Jesus say? No, you can't do it. The mere fact that you have to wait for it shows that it is given from heaven down to earth and you must receive it. Now, friends, you must receive it. This is how God has engineered it, but you cannot create it in yourself. And to wait also means that they would be tested by waiting at least a little bit. They were going to be tested by this period of waiting. There's another very precious phrase in verse 4 that I can't leave by. I think you noticed it as well because it's a beautiful little phrase. What does it say there in verse 4? It says that he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for what? To wait for the promise of the Father. Isn't that a beautiful way to describe the filling of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't something just sort of stir inside of you when you hear that phrase? The promise of the Father. I bet when I say that, hey, God has the promise of the Father for you, something within you says, well, I want that. Who doesn't want the promise from the Father? And there's many different angles to that. It shows that, that, that we should wait for it with eager anticipation. A promise of the Father can only be good, right? Oh, my Father in heaven has a promise for me? Oh boy, that's good. I want some of that. And then it also shows that it's reliable because the Father would never promise something that he could not fulfill. Could you imagine how terrible that would be of the Father in heaven to promise something? Say, well, <laughs> okay, I promise it to everybody, but not to you. No, no, it's for everybody. And that's another aspect of the promise of the Father. Because it is the promise of the Father, it shows that it belongs to all his children. Because it is the promise of the Father. What right do you and I have to, to, to boldly come before God and say, Father, Fill me with your Holy Spirit according to your promise. What right do we have to say that? If you are a child of God, you have that. If you are a son or a daughter of God because he's adopted you into his family, but by the work that he did in your life when you were born again by the Spirit of God, then you have the privilege of coming from the Father. You said that this promise comes to us as you as a father. Then you are my father. I am heir to this promise. But it also shows that it must be received by faith, as is the pattern of the promises of God throughout the scriptures, right? All throughout the scriptures, whenever there's a promise, God's people are invited to receive that promise by faith. And so here we have this beautiful thing here in verse 4, where the promise of the Father now also becomes the promise of the Son, and Jesus promised it to them. He said very plainly in verse 4, he said, or excuse me, now into verse 5, he said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, what does that mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Friends, I could speak for a whole hour on that subject, and I trust that it would be a profitable hour. But, but let me boil it down just to a couple sentences. I'll ask you this. What does it mean to be baptized in water? It means that you are immersed in water, right? that water covers you over. This is what the ancient Greek word means. They would use it in the ancient Greek vocabulary for something like dipping a cup or a garment and dye. It just means to be immersed, to be overwhelmed or something, to be covered over in something. Well, friends, the Holy Spirit of God wants to immerse you within himself. He wants you to be immersed in him. How wet is a person when they're baptized? A little bit. No, they're completely wet, right? When you're immersed under the water, every part of you is wet. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit covers every part of you. And this is simply what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In a few days, these disciples would be immersed in the Holy Spirit. And aren't you excited to see how that's going to work out in the coming weeks? To see this amazing work of the Spirit of God. And I tell you, you should be excited about it. 
Because I, I don't think that we can study, that we can look at this, that we can receive this from the Word of God without being touched by it ourselves, right? As we begin this study in the book of Acts, don't you have a wonderful anticipation that the Holy Spirit of God is going to do some wonderful things among us? That, that He's going to touch your life and my life in some ways that we might be able to predict, in other ways that we wouldn't be able to predict. But Jesus promised it for these disciples. And look at it right there in verse 5. He said that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It wouldn't happen immediately, but it would happen in just a few days. And Jesus had a purpose in not telling them exactly when it would come. Jesus is very indefinite here. Not many days from now. If I was one of the disciples, I would find that a very unsatisfying answer. I'd say, Jesus, no, come on. Three days, four days, five weeks, lay it out, Jesus. No, he says, not many days from now. Well, how much is many? No, just not many days from now. Now, verse 6. Here are the disciples. They're gathered together with Jesus. They're out at the Mount of Olives. And he says, verse 6, the disciples, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, this would be the last time that they would ever see Jesus in his physical body until they went to heaven to be with him forever. And there's nothing specific in the text to show us that they knew it was the last time. Think about it, friends. Forty days is a long time, isn't it? If you're encountering somebody and with them, oh, say, three or four times a week over a period of 40 days, you kind of get used to their presence, right? It's enough to make you feel comfortable in the fact that they're going to hang around for a while. I really wonder, and this would be a great question I'll have for Jesus, or I'll ask one of the disciples when I get to heaven, did you know that Jesus was about to ascend to heaven? Sometimes I think they might have, sometimes I think they might not have. I'll tell you one thing that makes me think that they might have is sort of the weight of the question that they asked, right? Wouldn't this be the kind of thing they would want to know? Jesus, before you go, answer this question. Before you go, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, friends, we as preachers, we like to beat up on the disciples, they're easy targets, aren't they sometimes? We see how silly and how carnal and how strange and how, you know, unreliable they often are. And it's a favorite sport of preachers to beat up on the disciples. I plead guilty to that. I tell you what, though, I used to beat up on the disciples for this particular question. Pfft, these guys, they apparently didn't understand anything about Jesus and his ministry. How could they ask such a stupid question this late in the game? You know what? In my more recent study, I don't believe that this was a stupid question at all. And I don't believe that Jesus treated it as a stupid question. Matter of fact, I think this was an actually a very intelligent question from the disciples. And I'll tell you why. Because it was a question based on their understanding that Jesus had instituted the new covenant. Listen, just six weeks before, Jesus stood before them at the Last Supper on the night before his crucifixion. And he, and he held in front of them a cup filled with wine. And he said, guys, this is the new covenant in my blood. I am establishing a new covenant with you. And that must have blown their minds because these were men who knew the Old Testament. And they knew the promises of the Old Testament about the new covenant. And they knew that one aspect of the new covenant, not the only aspect, but certainly one of the aspects of the new covenant, was that there would be a national restoration of Israel. That Israel would be restored as a nation. And not just restored, but actually lifted up to be one of the exalted nations in the earth that there would be a glorious national restoration. And I don't fault them at all for saying, Jesus, you're the one who said you were instituting the new covenant. And this is an aspect of the new covenant that we do not yet see fulfilled. Jesus, when are you going to do it? I don't think it was a carnal or an illogical question at all. Actually, the response of Jesus also indicates that I don't think he regarded it as a foolish question. Because as you're going to see in the next verses that we read, Jesus didn't rebuke them. Jesus doesn't say, oh, you stupid disciples. In no way is there a rebuke. But look at how he answers, verse 7. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I mean, just stop right there in the middle of verse 7. 
Guys, it's not for you to know. Now, I don't take that as a rebuke. You ask me this question, when are we going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Did Jesus say, forget about that business of restoring the kingdom to Israel? That whole plan is off. I know you read about it in the Old Testament, but no, I changed my plans. Jesus doesn't say anything about that. He says, guys, it's not for you to know the answer to that question. Don't have your minds on that question. Let's begin now again, verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, Jesus warned his disciples against inquiring into aspects of the timing of God's kingdom because those were things that were reserved for the wisdom of God the Father alone. Guys, don't worry about that. By the way, don't you think that it was very wise for Jesus to not outline his plan for the next 2,000 years to the disciples? Okay, guys, let me answer your question here. You want to know when we're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Well, let me explain to you. It's not going to happen for about 2,000 years. And can you imagine the disciples? 2,000 years, I give up, they would say. No, Jesus, listen, guys, don't worry about it. That's not your concern. It might overly discourage them in the work that they had to do right then. And it might make them less of the aspect of the kingdom of God that was right present with them at the time. Friends, I just want you to think just for a moment. I just want to dwell on this just for a moment before we move on. Jesus received a question from the disciples and he said, I'm not going to tell you the answer. Don't worry about it. And he told them that for their own good. Now, does Jesus ever do that in your life? Oh, God, tell me why. Give me an answer. And God says, no, I'm not going to tell you. Now, do you know why he doesn't tell you? It's not because he's angry with you. It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you're useless in his eyes. It's because God knows that in his great wisdom, it's better for you not to know. And you cry, how could it be better for me not to know? It's better for you not to know. (laughs) You know this principle with your children, right? Aren't there things just better for them not to know? And God treats us that way as a very loving father as well. He did exactly that thing with the disciples. But I want to stress this point. At the same time, Jesus did not say that there was not going to be a restoration of the kingdom of Israel. He simply said that speculation into the time and the date of this restoration was not proper for the disciples. Instead, what were they to focus on? Look at it right there in verse 8. But you shall receive power. If the national kingdom they wanted would be delayed, the power they needed would not be delayed. They would soon receive power with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when they received that power with the coming of the Holy Spirit, what would happen in their lives? He said, and you shall be witnesses to me. That's the very natural result of receiving the promised power, is that they would become witnesses of Jesus all over the earth. Where did he say? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. I want you to notice this really wasn't a command. Jesus didn't command them, okay, first get filled with the Spirit, and then I command you to be my witnesses. No, it's a very simple statement of fact. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses to me. Those words shall be are in the indicative, not in the imperative. Jesus didn't recommend that they become witnesses. He said that they would be witnesses. Now, do you know what a witness is? A witness is somebody who witnesses something, right? That's pretty simple. A witness is somebody who sees or hears or experiences something. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you something to see something to hear, and something to experience of my work, and you are going to witness it, and then you're just going to testify to other people of what you have seen me do. But friends, if we want to be witnesses of what God does, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The best training program for evangelism is of very little effectiveness without the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, I am in favor of training programs for evangelism. I think they're good things to do, and I think we should do more of that instead of less of that. 
But listen, even with the greatest program ever, it's a very little effectiveness without the filling of the Holy Spirit. But once they were filled with the Spirit, once they had received something that they had seen or heard or experienced of the work of Jesus, then they would be his witnesses, notice it in verse 8, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The progress and the spread of the gospel to all of these places becomes the outline of the book of Acts. I mean, Acts chapters 1 through 7 describes the gospel in Jerusalem. And then Acts 8 through 12 speaks of the gospel in Judea and Samaria. And then Acts 13 through 28 tells of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. That is the outline of the book of Acts. Now, you can imagine the disciples as they're hearing Jesus say this. Uh, Jesus, you want us to do this in Jerusalem? Don't you realize that's the place where they just killed you? Maybe not a good idea, Jerusalem. Uh, Judea, didn't they reject your ministry in Judea? Samaria, oh Jesus, you know the Samaritans, those guys are impossible, we can't do that. The uttermost parts of the earth, well, the, the Gentiles are all out there, what's the use of that? But Jesus knew exactly that's where the message should go. God, when a witness sent to all these three places, and the Holy Spirit would empower them to do this work. All right, let's take a look at the last three verses we're going to deal with in our text this morning. Verses 9, 10, and 11, where we read. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. What a scene this must have been. Listen, when you get up into heaven, and I don't know if you'll get there before I do, or God willing, we'll all go up there together when Jesus comes and takes away his church. But listen, when you get to heaven, go to the video library and check the video out of this one. Wouldn't you just love to see this? Wouldn't you love to see the expressions on the disciples' face as Jesus just literally starts levitating from them? They're like, oh my heavens, what's he doing? And then Jesus just waves goodbye. And I love what it says in the Gospel of Luke. It says that as Jesus left the earth and ascended into heaven, his hands were raised, blessing his church. There is just raised, bless, God bless you guys, bless you, bless you. And he ascends up in heaven, slowly withdrawing, right? Caught up into a cloud. They could see him going, 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 gone. They would know he left. And he left in such a strange, visible, remarkable way that they could know he was not coming back, which was very important for him to do it this way. It was important for him to leave while they were watching. That's what verse 9 says. While they watched, he was taken up. It was important for Jesus to leave his disciples in this manner. Now, now, in theory, he could have simply just vanished into heaven and the Father's present in a secret sort of way, right? You know, kind of that Star Trek teleporter thing or something like that. Who knows? But Jesus wanted his disciples to know, Guys, I am gone from this earth for good. I know that I have appeared and reappeared among you for the last 40 days. I've been with you and then I've been gone. Here I am, here I'm not. I know you've seen me off and on these 40 days. But guys, now I'm going back to heaven for good. Why was that very important for them to hear? Because listen to what Jesus said to them in John chapter 16. He said this, It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Isn't that beautiful? They would remember those words from Jesus. Jesus, you said that when you go, when you depart, you will send down the Holy Spirit to us. And they would have so much assurance when they got together. He will send the Holy Spirit. He loves us. The promise of the Father has now become the promise of the Son. And He will send the Holy Spirit because He said that He would do this. 
So there are the disciples watching Jesus just leave up in heaven, blown away by what they saw. And they stand there and they're just blinking and looking up into the sky as it says, gazing up into heaven. I don't know how long they stood there. We got to check this out in the video library in heaven when we get there. They sat there for 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes. I don't know. But finally, God has to send two angels, two men, apparently angels. Verse 11. What are you guys looking at? Why are you gazing up into heaven? Now, the logical answer would have been, did you just see what Jesus did? But no, the question from the angels was very logical. Guys, Jesus told you to do something. Don't you stand around looking up into heaven when he told you to go do something. He told you to go do, go back to Jerusalem and you go wait for the promise of the Father. And they said something very wonderful in verse 11. They said, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same Jesus, the same Jesus of the Gospels, the, the same Jesus of love and grace and goodness and wisdom and care, this same Jesus who ascended up into heaven, he's going to come back in the same way. Th doesn't that thrill your heart? Because listen, do you know how he left? He left physically, and he's going to come back the same way. He left visibly, and he's going to come back the same way. He left from the Mount of Olives, and he's going to come back the same way. He left with the presence of his disciples, and he's going to come back the same way. And he left blessing his church, and he's going to come back the same way. What an impact this must have made on the disciples. Now, as we close, I just want you to think, there Jesus is, gathered together with his disciples, just before he's going to ascend into heaven, and the disciples have a question for Jesus, right? Jesus, here's our question. When will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Is now the time? What they thought they needed from Jesus was new information, right? Jesus, give us some information. What did Jesus know that they really needed? Power. Power from the Holy Spirit. And I cannot help but think that that may be the exact situation with many of you. You think that what you need from God is some new information. God, give me information. If you would just tell me what's going on, if you would just show me the future, if you would just chart me out, God, when am I going to get a job? God, when am I going to get a, a romantic relationship that I really need? Well, when is this problem going to be fixed? When is that, God, when, when, show me the future, God, and that's where I need information from you, God. And would not God say to you this morning, you think you need information, what you really need from me is power from the Holy Spirit. And that power is promised. It is called the promise of the Father. So how do you get some of that promise of the Father? Well, I'll just give you two steps. Number one, be his child, right? And if you're not his child this morning, you can be. You can put your trust in Jesus Christ and become a true child of God. But secondly, come to him as a father and say, Father, fulfill your promise. Now, he may have you wait for it in some way, and I don't know what that means in your life. I'll let God figure that out for you. But if it's a promise from the Father... It is due to the children, and you can ask for it in faith. Now, right now, we're going to receive communion. The worship team's going to come up. We're going to enter back into worship. The ushers are going to come forward and distribute the plates that, that are filled both with pieces of bread and, and cups. And, and the bread and the cup commemorates for us what Jesus did. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that you need this power of the Spirit, but the power of the Spirit begins with what Jesus did on the cross. You see, it's a dangerous thing to forget that He is the Holy Spirit. And He comes into those who have been made holy by the work of Jesus on the cross. We're not talking about power in some detached sense. We're talking about the power of God as it enters into his holy vessels. So when that bread and that cup comes around, I want you to take a piece of bread, I want you to take a cup, and I want you to prepare yourselves to receive it, and we'll all receive it together. But I will say this. 
If you refuse Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, and you don't want this work of God in your life, then let the bread and let the cup pass you by. Nobody will point you out. Nobody will make a big deal about it. But please, this is for those who want to receive what Jesus did for them on the cross in worship and in reverence. Father, prepare us to do that right now. We're so grateful, Lord, for the power that you promised to us by your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we want to connect with you, with the God of this glorious power, by what you've given us in the bread and the cup. Help us to do it now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.